Hi, I'm Bob Herbert. Welcome to OpEd.TV. Nearly 100% of the income gains since the end of the Great Recession have gone to the top 10% of Americans. Nearly 40% of all black children in America are growing up in poverty. America's physical plant, its roads and bridges, schoolhouses and harbors and dams and water systems are in sad shape, but we can't seem to get them repaired or replaced. Three quarters of Americans think the country is on the wrong track. What's happened to this country that once took great pride in its so-called can-do spirit? I'll ask that question of my guest, Robert Johnson, a brilliant economist who has served as managing director at Soros Fund Management, as chief economist of the United States Senate Banking Committee, and is now the president of the Institute for New Economic Thinking here in New York. Rob, welcome, and thank you so much for coming in. It's my pleasure. So let's talk directly about the economy first. Um, much is being made during this presidential election year of the discontent and even anger uh, among much of the electorate. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that people are having a hard time just making it from day to day. This is a country that has, uh, as I grew up, thought of its proudest creation as uh, sort of a widespread uh, middle class, a secure mm. middle class. What's happened to the uh, living standards of ordinary working Americans? Why so much trouble? Well, I think the combination of globalization, particularly vis-a-vis -vis emerging countries like China, which is a large, low-paid labor force, technological change, and perhaps most wickedly, a change in policy where, which you might call the plutocracy, dominates policy making. And the more wealth they obtain, the more they manipulate the structures of government to reinforce their wealth making at the expense of the population at large. If you look at the official numbers, you would think that a few years after the end of the Great uh, Recession, things were not too bad. The official unemployment rate is hovering around 5%. There's low inflation. New jobs are being created every month. And yet, that gives a very skewed picture of, go of what's going on. So why is there such a disconnect between the official numbers and the reality of what's happening with ordinary Americans? Well, first of all, things are better than they were in 2008, 9, and 10, mm -hmm. but at a very slow, almost tepid pace of recovery. Secondly, our employment numbers classify people who aren't looking for work as not unemployed. Right, they're not counted as and, unemployed. And people get so deeply discouraged that the real, how we say, measure that one should look at is the employment population ratio, which right. is still quite far down, meaning there are more people out of work. Young people in particular are some saddled with student debt and finding work that's sort of like part-time work without benefits, not particularly high wages. And these people, which we might say on the runway to developing a career, are despairing as to whether they're going to take off or not. Right. So what we're really talking about is um, economic inequality in the sense that there is a narrow group at the top that's doing extremely well, mm -hmm. while a lot of Americans, I, most Americans, I think, are, are really uh, sort of struggling. We hear a lot about the term. We hear the terms uh, bounced about wealth inequality, income inequality, but we don't really address these issues head on. If we were going to talk honestly, straight on, about inequality in this country, what are some of the things we'd be saying? I think we'd be talking about the lobbying power of the very wealthy. Jane Mayer's got a recent book on this, the New Yorker writer, Dark Money. Right. Uh, I think this concern is more important than any static snapshot. Americans are pretty good at taking a punch, and they get up off the mat if they think they can continue. Right. Right now, people feel like it's ominous. There's no way forward. The game is rigged. So I'm knocked down, and nobody's trying to help me. As you said at the outset, all of the gains from the recovery went to the top 1%. Now, generally, economists, and, and lately especially conservatives, uh, would say that um, economic growth is, is what you really want to achieve. This is the way you get li living standards up. But if all the benefits of growth, or nearly all the benefits of growth, 
go to that narrow band of very wealthy individuals at the top, then what's the real point of, mm -hmm. of growth? Growth is not helping you there. And then what's your alternative? Well, the, perhaps the most haunting statistic is people talk about growth and they talk about everybody sharing in the gains from growth, metaphorically. Mm -hmm. The haunting statistic is that productivity is going up and wages are not. And, and, and product, when productivity is going up, that's Profits when your are, wages and your living standards uh, traditionally or historically should be rising, but they're not. So ex, ex Profits <laughs> are going up enormously right. in working conditions, meaning uh, the amount people are working and so forth is still very intense, but their compensation is not keeping pace. So this means that the, that the folks that, who are, are running the corporations, who are the owners, at the top the of the economy, are, yeah, the are not sharing the, the, the benefits from this productivity. That's right. And in large part, they don't think they have to because there are workforces offshore which are paid less or there is less environmental regulation surrounding their foreign plants. And so they don't think they have to, what you might call submit to that bargain. So we have a presidential campaign where people are upset. These factors not really clearly talked about, but certainly play into, they're probably the primary factors about why so many people are, are upset in this election. People seem confused. They, they know that their living standards, that, that they're not doing that well. They're worried about their children. They're having trouble sending their kids to school. Their kids come out of school with this debt that you're talking about but they're not clear on what their answers are or even what they're looking for. But right. what should they be looking for? When, in a presidential campaign, uh, political issues are argued back and forth. If you were gonna focus this issue of inequality, uh, how would you do that? The first thing is a fully employed economy. When people are living in dread, their bargaining power diminishes. When they're unemployed or underemployed, their bargaining power and their sense of well-being diminishes. Mm -hmm. A commitment to use all the instruments of policy, regulatory policy, fiscal policy, monetary policy, to ensure full employment and full utilization of resources, particularly the human resources, mm -hmm. is the first condition. And we're not doing that? We haven't been doing that for a long time. One of the ways, one of my pet peeves is uh, infrastructure. And, um, and um, we know that the American um, infrastructure is not in great shape. It needs to be um, uh, rebuilt. Uh, it would also be a um, terrific source of large numbers of good-paying, well-paying jobs. Um, this would be a particularly good time to do it because with interest rates at historic lows or close to historic lows, it would be much easier to, to finance this rebuilding. And yet we're not doing it. That's right. Uh, why not? Well, my sense is to rebuild the infrastructure enlarges the role of government. And there are many people, what we might call in the plutocratic sector, mm -hmm. that don't want to take on new projects where government looks like it's done well. When Obama became president, people were talking about the next New Deal, all our Roosevelt's right. New Deal. And there was a very strong movement. I remember hearing Mitch McConnell say, our mission is to make sure that Obama can't bring about another New Deal. Exactly. They don't want to prove, contrary to the years since Ronald Reagan, that government can actually do good. They actually wanted the Obama administration to fail. That's right. Uh, so you mentioned um, Reagan, which was actually going to be my next question, because when you talk about uh, people wanting to shrink government or not wanting government to have uh, a larger role in the economy and other aspects of American life, I mean, it was Reagan who famously said that government is the problem. Um, explain why in, in our kind of a society, a, a large, advanced, capitalist, consumer capitalist society, it's absolutely essential for government to play a, a major role in economic uh, matters and also to be a major investor um, in, in the economy. Ex explain why that's the case, why it's not good to say government should get out of the way and just let business go ahead and take care of whatever it wants to. Well, first of all, let's um, be fair to conservatives who have criticized the government. Mm -hmm. The financial bailouts are ones that Joe Stiglitz said the polluters got paid. <laughs> so there is a loss of confidence in the effectiveness of government, either the preventive medicine of financial supervision and regulation 
or who bore the burden of the bailouts. And that's, in my mind, turned the crisis from a financial crisis to the crisis of the legitimacy of governance, mm -hmm. which I think is what's the millstone around our neck as we watch Trump and Bernie Sanders and others telling us the system's broken. They're getting a lot of affirmation. But there are things, just looking at it in a comparative sense, look around the world, look at Germany in the era of globalization, after the crisis and so forth. People do invest in retraining of people. People do provide full employment, though Germany's not strong in that regard. Markets are not manna from heaven. Markets are structures that require administration, enforcement. There are wonderful rules. Bernard Harcourt of Columbia University has a book called The Illusion of Free Markets. Government structures underpin the integrity of markets. Right. Infrastructure complements with an E private investment. The platform, whether it's highways or roads and bridges or so forth, facilitate commerce and inspire activity not only through their direct employment, by making the economy more efficient for the private sector to be located here. The withering of our infrastructure is part of what chases jobs offshore. We seem to have had our act reasonably together in the U.S. in those early post-World War II decades. Um, employment was high, wages and living standards were growing, there was less, in, there was inequality, but significantly less inequality than there is now. At what point did things begin to go haywire and, and, and why do you think it did? Uh, my sense is when you look at the history, in the early to mid 70s, coming out of the Great Society, the OPEC oil shocks, that there was a compression of profits and businessmen rebelled. There's a famous uh, memo no, by yeah. Lewis Powell, who's a subsequent Went on to uh, become a Supreme Court Supreme Justice, Court Justice mm -hmm. which he wrote to the Chamber of Commerce mm -hmm. about rebelling against, whether it's Ralph Nader's consumer protections or labor unions or left ideology in the universities. And it was a call to action to uh, what you might call a corporate response to the social policy of that time. I think since that time, we've seen increasing use of monetary policy to stabilize prices irrespective of what happened to employment. It started with the Air Traffic Controllers Union in Ronald right. Reagan. We've seen an increasing, uh, which you might call, access to global markets, largely through technological change in the information communication technology area, and a little bit in transport. But we now see container ships operated by robots and robotic plants making textiles around the world. So a lot of production got outsourced from the United States, and that, how would I say, changed the balance between labor and management within this country. Do you have any sense of where this is going? Because workers are in a, a really um, disadvantageous position, if, if that's a word at this point. Um, they're not well organized. Labor unions have been in trouble uh, for a long time. Um, the advantage is all with on, on the um, side of industry and the um, CEOs and the, and, and the bosses. Wages are stagnant at best. Um, there's no uh, uh, much less job security than there used to, to be. Very few uh, benefits for people coming into um, new jobs. So what's the outlook um, for workers? Is there any reason to be optimistic about the state of ordinary workers in the U.S.? Well, what's the old uh, saying? You can be hopeful but not optimistic. <laughs> uh, my sense is what might be hopeful. We've had some trade agreements that have been very corporate oriented. A trade agreement that talks about environmental conditions and labor conditions, leveling that playing field, if you will, as Douglas Frazier, the old former mm -hmm. uh, head of UAW. UAW, right. He said, Years ago, our job is to raise the floor, not drive everything to the lowest common denominator. Mm -hmm. I don't see a lot of action in that regard, but I see political leaders, not just in the United States with Trump and Bernie and Hillary fighting it out. I see right-wing parties all over Europe. I see disorientation and authoritarian control increasing in China. It may be that the social unsustainability of this period of compression of living standards may lead to a reaction 
like a, what you might call leveling of the playing field by right. raising the floor around the world, a reinstatement of health standards. The Flint water crisis in Michigan right. is a really, really bad sign of, yes, we need government and people who solely focus on money and not humanity do tremendous harm, and harm to morale as well as bodies. And it, at some point there tends to become a limit, if history is any kind of a guide, to the amount of harm you can inflict on the populace before yes. there is an effective response. That's right. And, and we all dread what you might call blood in the streets. Right. And you don't want to let it get to that far, to that point. But it's in that anxiety of crisis that people come to the point where they, which you might call, are inspired to accept change, or in the case of the people who are injured, they say, I cannot go on living with dignity by tolerating these conditions, right. and I will risk even my person to inspire change. So you mentioned Trump and Bernie and Hillary. We're in the midst of a um, presidential election right now. Um, as an economist, when you look at their uh, respective economic programs, do any of them have what you would consider to be a sound approach to the U.S. economy right now? Well, what I think is troubling is that Hillary relies on what I'll call traditional expertise. And some of that is very solid and very moderate. But we are associating in our society experts with people who recommended globalization <laughs> who recommended welfare reform, who recommended financial deregulation, and the trust in experts in this campaign season is non-existent. And whether it should be is a different thing, but Trump essentially is not offering policies. <laughs> He's offering demons. Right. And at this point, Bernie Sanders is saying, these are the policies I would have if your system wasn't broken. If money politics and lobbying didn't rule Washington, it could look like single-payer health care, which much of the industrial world has, right. free education like you see in German universities. But how we get from that, what you might call, not a utopian vision, because it's a vision of things that we see in place in other countries, mm -hmm. but it's not available to us until we repair our politics. Right. So Bernie's agenda is less about economic policies and more about the vision of economic policies if we do the policy that he recommends, which is repair the representativeness of our democracy. So how do you go about rep re repairing our democracy, re repairing our yes. um, politics, even uh, accepting that this could take a long time? Mm -hmm. How do you go about it? If I were, how to say, putting bullseyes on the horizon to mm -hmm. aim for, the first thing I would do is say public financing of elections Second thing I would say is that our media companies get their bandwidth out of license right. from our government. As part of our civic duty, those franchises should set aside some time so it doesn't cost people like they're selling soap in order to talk to us about their candidacies. I wanted to ask you a question about a um, specific, you couldn't call it a, a policy, but maybe a comment. Uh, by Donald Trump, who's always talking about uh, what a great deal maker he is. Uh, and he was addressing the issue of the national debt. And he was saying that he could make a deal with other countries and uh, get them to accept, get creditors to accept less as a way of reducing America's national debt. Uh, explain why, uh, I'm going to put this kindly, how, explain why this is not a sound idea. Well, the idea that if you default on the debt or restructure the debt, that the debt is then sound. <laughs> is when first, for instance, we, first of all, there are times when debt needs to be restructured. Right. But when it doesn't appear that the United States is on the cusp of default, to exercise that default is going to harm trust right. in the credit quality of America. Because if he does it now, maybe in three years, he'll decide to do a little more. And investors will look and say, wow, to hold this stuff with this guy in charge, we're going to charge a much higher interest rate. And the potential economic impact of that? Is depressing. Right. The uh, higher interest rates, higher mortgage rates, higher consumer loan rates, higher business loan rates for capital formation, all are depressing. I mentioned um, that the poverty rate for African-American children 
is close to 40 percent. The last number I saw from uh, the, the Pew Research Center was 38 percent, which I think is a horrifying number. We've also got tens of thousands of people in our homeless shelters right here in the city um, every night. There's a tremendous amount of poverty still in the United States for a country that's a, that's a wealthy country. Why is there so much poverty still in America and why is that poverty so disproportionate among African Americans? Uh, that poverty more broadly should not be in America and it's a f flaw in what I call the representativeness of government that it's tolerated. It's also a flaw in the running of the macroeconomy so that people in the middle class who seem fearful and are declining are not willing to recognize out of their own fear that there are other people worse off than they are. With regard to black and white, the racial politics of the distribution of poverty, I think this is horrid. It's a project, a product of what some have called otherness, of saying there is a group of people who do not deserve to be treated like humans. That is contrary to the principles in our Constitution, Declaration of Independence, and that that has been tolerated. And you can see it when you look at, say, for instance, the economist Raj Chetty's uh, papers on the geography of opportunity. The places that are at the bottom, where I see the trampoline springs are broken, are segregated neighborhoods in places like Milwaukee, Detroit, and Baltimore. There, they've just drawn a line around these places and they let them sink. And the, this is just intolerable in the long run. And our, and our society is beginning to wake up to this. Jimmy uh, Carter announced he's going to hold a conference this fall because the way these conditions are unfolding and the way that Trump is behaving about race inspire him to action as an ex-president. Yeah, so we've still got much too much racism in the, in the society and campaigns like Trump and, and other factors that, have, that are emerging in this presidential race are just worsening the, the situation so that we're, instead of getting better, we're going backwards. Which yeah, is... I'm, I'm not going to raise my hand as an expert because economists under siege, <laughs> but I defy anybody to show me the numbers where if you took care of young black people, children are innocent, if you took care of them with what it took financially, you would not burden this country. You would not weigh down this country. It's small in relation to the scale of things to do a great deal of good regarding the health, nutrition, education of children, of African American children. On that point, we're gonna to have to stop. I wish we had more time. Rob Johnson, thank you so much for coming in. Thank you. Uh, we'll be back in a moment with a final word. There is increasing evidence that a lot of us are becoming lunatic captives of our cell phones and other tech devices. A survey by the nonprofit advocacy group Common Sense Media found that half of all teenage respondents said they felt addicted to their mobile devices, and more than a quarter felt that their parents were addicted as well. Parents are complaining, in some cases, that their children's use of computerized technology has become obsessive, pathological. And a common complaint of family members is that close relatives, parents and siblings, are so distracted by their devices that their lack of normal interaction with the rest of the family has become unhealthy. When I speak of becoming lunatic captives, what I'm referring to is the type of behavior that is life-threatening. Texting while crossing busy streets, for example, and of course, the use of mobile devices while driving. The Common Sense Media Survey found that 56% of parents acknowledged either texting or otherwise looking at mobile devices while behind the wheel. One can only wonder what the percentage is for teen drivers. The upshot? Despite improved safety measures in cars, deaths from auto crashes rose by 8% last year. That was the largest annual increase in motor vehicle deaths in the past half century. I'd be willing to bet a lot of money that when more detailed data become available, 
we'll find that a lot of those increased fatalities were the result of texting and other forms of tech-based distracted driving. That's all for now. See you next time.